My, my apologies to students um, that I left you in the waiting room. I had thought that I had the waiting room turned off, um, but apparently it was on and so you were stuck in there. And there's like 15 of you. Seems that, that uh, coming to class is not popular at 7.30 in the morning. I kind of understand that, that's fine. All right, uh, so uh, to start over again, um, in the previous lessons, we were talking about the computer architecture. In this lesson, uh, I moved away from computer architecture. We did speak a little bit about decomposition, which is just basically taking a big problem and breaking it into different components and then, uh, and then approaching each one of those components separately. Uh, so uh, there is this process as this slide shows, hopefully you can see this slide. And um, okay, so I got a bit of stuff going on in the, yeah, okay, good morning students. Uh, hopefully you can see this slide, but um, the, uh, the, the points here about decomposition, generalization to, to, to uh, abstraction, the idea is we take a big problem and we break it into constituent parts, components. That's decomposition. That's decomposition. Uh, so an example of that, right? I have to go to school tomorrow. Okay, so that's a problem. All right, so in order to do that, I'll have to wake up. That's one component, right? The next one is I'll have to get ready, um, uh, um, shower, eat, that type of thing. That's, uh, that's another component. I'll have to get transport. Okay, there's another problem. And each of those could be broken down too, right? To a point where we could uh, easily achieve them. Uh, another example of sort of decomposition of problem is uh, I have a uh, project that I have to hand in on the 30th of September. That's a big problem. Then I decompose it to, well, first I have to do my research, component number one. Then I have to write my introductions, component number two. I, you get the idea. Eventually I get to the last component, which is uh, submitting it. By breaking it down, it makes it much easier. And it also makes it so that we can plan the work, right? So like today I'll work on my references. You know, I, 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 it's uh, not doing everything in the last two days. So that's the idea of decomposition to take a problem. It, and it's kind of necessary for computers, uh, for, for solving things with computers because uh, computers have that very fixed and simple sort of um, compared to humans, uh, sort of linear kind of architecture that uh, requires us to sort of very carefully and precisely specify exactly what they're going to do. So once we've de decomposed a problem, what we try to do is we recompose it. I guess you could say, and that's what uh, generalization is. Generalization is, uh, so this is how we did it in the analog real world. And, th and then we look at that and we sort of understand the concepts of it. Now we're gonna take those concepts and reconstitute them in a way that it can work in the digital world on this computer. And so we generalize that problem to uh, something else. And the best way to do that is to include some abstraction in that process. So that's what I mean by reforming the whole to get something more efficient. And the new view of the problem uh, will include some abstraction so that it uh, ignores uh, parts of the problem that we may have seen, but are irrelevant to us actually solving it on the computer. So, all right. So, um, this gives us this concept of layering, and I've got a diagram here that'll explain it a little bit better. As I mentioned, this did come from the, the uh, reference book, which is in the, uh, in the uh, material that I gave the first day that, that talks about the course outline, et cetera. There it does reference a book uh, as a reading book. It's not a textbook, you don't have to buy it, but um, if you wanted to read more on this, that's the book by Beecher, and I've left it as a reference at the end of this set of notes. Uh, so layering obscures, obscures means to hide from us seeing so that there's facts that relate to the original problem that we don't see. Now, why do we don't see some facts? We don't want to see them, right? We only want to see the facts that are relevant to what we're trying to do now. And so that's the process of um, abstracting is focusing on the facts that are relevant to our solution and ignoring facts that are not. Um, now, the problem is that in doing so, in doing so, in, in obscuring the facts, 
we might obscure facts that later turn out to be relevant. That, you know, on our first look, we say, oh, well, that, that fact's not relevant, that fact's not relevant. I don't, I'm not gonna include it in my model, in my, in my abstraction. And then later we find out, oh, well, actually it is. And I'll give you an example of that later. And so that brings us to this idea of modeling. Modeling is a subset or is a kind of abstraction. And what modeling does is it presents a simplified sort of not working, but kind of looks whole um, view of the problem. So a simplified view of the problem with only including the relevant um, sort of uh, uh, parts of it. Now, uh, as it says there, modeling, you can have a model, which is a dynamic model, which includes any changes in state, any interventions or inputs or outputs, or you can have a static model, which just represents the, uh, the situation in a particular point in time. All of those things we'll look at here in a minute here. Uh, so here's an abstraction that you may have seen if you guys have traveled, even in Doha, I think, if you get on the metro, you guys have been on the metro or you've gone to the metro thing, you'll probably see most metros. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I haven't ridden on the metro in Doha. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a big public transport person. <laughs> you know, I came to work on my motorcycle today. I mean, I'm so happy I live in Doha because we can have our own transport. Um, but yeah, if you're in a, um, in a European city, uh, yeah, you're, or Japan, for example, yeah, you, you use the metro because um, your options for independent travel are much reduced. Um, so this is the type of thing that you'll see on the, uh, the top of the wall on the, in the metro. If you look up there, you'll see a little map which will show uh, all of the different stations of the metro usually. And, uh, and, and actually you'll probably have some kind of electronic um, sort of um, a display, which is gonna show you where you are and what's the next station and you know, that type of thing. And so uh, this is a model. Now, wh what I want you to think about in looking at that model, as I said, if you've ever been on a Metro, you'll see something like this, um, but it represents everything that you need to know in riding the train, but it doesn't really, so it's, it's not really a, a particularly good map. You know, uh, it, it's not showing, uh, you know, the distances are not to scale. Um, you know, um, so two of those uh, stations might be, uh, you know, uh, within 200 meters of each other and others might be, you know, three kilometers from each other. So it's typically not to scale. Um, it, it, so if you wanted to get out and walk from one station to another, it wouldn't be very helpful, but it's pretty good from a point of view of you sitting on the train and knowing what you need to do next uh, for wh and where do you have to change. So for example, if you wanted to go from, um, so there's this Brunswick Road station. You, oh, oh, well, I can see it on my screen here, but maybe the people here can. Uh, if you want to go from Brunswick Road station to um, uh, this one here to Meadowbank Road, you'd know that you'd have to get off uh, here at uh, Rotherham Central and probably change to a different line. Um, and so that, that would be useful information to you if you're sitting in the train. You'd look up at that map and say, ah, yeah, I got to get off at that interchange and change lines. Um, and so, I mean, similarly here in Doha, if you've ridden, the, if you've ridden, the, I mean, my 15 year old daughter, she, that's, she, she's always on that train with her friends, right? So they, where they go to uh, the Mall of Qatar, right? Cause it's got a station and they go down to, uh, is it Qatar has got something? A anyways, you know, so they're riding around on that and it's really great for them. We're so lucky we live in a city where um, that's a safe thing for 15 year old girls to do. I mean, in some cities it wouldn't be, in a lot of cities, um, but uh, here it is. And so thank God for um, Qatar, we're so lucky. And I really, really mean that. Um, it's great being in Qatar. Um, why would anybody go anywhere else? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I like to stay here for a lot longer. Uh, anyway, so here's an, another example of an abstraction and layers of abstraction. Now this one is a little bit sort of, sort of hard to sort of see a bit, but in reality, when we look at an email, I'm gonna send an email from me to you, all right? So what's gonna happen in my layer of abstraction, all I'm gonna think is, okay, I open up the email application and I type something and I send it to you. So I can constrain my, my understanding of the real world is over there on the left, this thing here, uh, it's just 
which I see this interface, uh, which comes up either on my mobile phone, because I can send an email from my mobile phone, or on my laptop or on my desktop. And so I put my name, password in, type something and send it. And that's my understanding of the real world. And so that can be represented as an abstraction by this thing over here on the left, which is just a box saying uh, email uh, application. But we would know as IT people that um, there must be some kind of communication between that email application and the computer memory and which stores it and then puts it onto the network. In real life, we'd know that the computer memory is actually stored as uh, zeros and ones. And that when we put that onto the network, the real life uh, consequence of that, because we have a digital network, we're not using analog networks anymore. The digital network also works with on and off signals, to, um, which are changes in um, voltage on the network. Uh, and th that's seen here. So the change in this voltage from zero volts to five volts or whatever. And so that's your on and off that's gonna go across that network line. Um, so we have our real world here and we have our abstraction, which is quite easy for most of us to understand. Um, here's another one. This is uh, maybe easier to understand as well. Let's imagine that we had a car rental company. And actually it's not constrained to just being a car rental company. It's a rental company uh, because they rent cars, uh, vans, uh, commercial vehicles, um, motorcycles. And so um, uh, what are the idea of the image that we're showing here is layers of abstraction. Depending on what information we want about a vehicle, we abstract to that level. So for example, if we wanted to know about types of vehicles, we might use that. Uh, and so for example, we might have an abstraction for a coupe. But let's say that we didn't really care what type of vehicle, we just wanted to have a car. We didn't care if it was a coupe or if it was a, um, you know, a sedan, or then we might, we might have a different layer, um, which is just a car. Or let's say we didn't care what kind of vehicle it was at all, right? To us, we don't care if it's a car, we don't care if it's a van, we don't care if it's a motorcycle, we just want a vehicle. So we abstract to a different layer and, and where the only details that we have is that it's a vehicle. So, you know, we have its VIN number, um, and, uh, you know, it's registration and those types of things. So we don't have other details that would be if we were at this other layer. Um, if we had in our inventory, that would be at a layer which just every sort of vehicle that we have, including the parts for those vehicles, um, spare parts, tools, et cetera, we would just record all of that information. So all we'd have is like a part number or a vehicle number. So depending on how much information we want, we could have a different layer of abstraction. Is this making sense? Yeah, okay. I do appreciate the people who come to class because uh, I can look at you and I can see if, you're, if it makes sense to you or not. Usually I can tell by the look on your face. Um, so for example, then what if in that database that we had, we, we, we just recorded this information about vehicles. Then turns out that we have a customer that wants to have a van. Why do they want a van? They want a van because they need to move some stuff. And so we need to have a space capacity in the vehicle. And we haven't recorded that in our layer of abstraction. All we've done is recorded the vehicle number, you know, it's, it's um, um, plate number, license plate number, it's VIN number, uh, how old it is, whatever. But the customer comes in and says, I want a van to move my stuff around. Well, how much stuff you got, right? So, so in that case, we would have had to have a different layer of abstraction. We would have had to recorded some information about the van in terms of its capacity to move stuff. And if we hadn't already done that, we might have to change our model. So sometimes we abstract too much. We, we abstract to a layer. If we just said, all we're gonna do is record stuff about details, then the customer comes in and we got a new business case, I guess you could say, and then we might have to go and change our model a bit. We now have to abstract. We, we now, it turns out that some of those details that we thought weren't relative, relevant are. And so we need to include those. So the point that I'm trying to make there is sometimes our designing of a solution to a problem 
can be an iterative process. It is we think that we got the solution, and then the then it turns out that the business case changes a little bit, and so we have to go back and look at our abstractions and change them a bit, change our model. And so that might happen here because the customer came in and said, well, you know, not just any vehicle will do. You know what I mean? I'm not just trying to get across town. So motor motorcycle's not going to do. And actually a car and a coupe's not going to do either. I need to have a van because I'm moving all my computer stuff around or something like that, or, or I'm in a band or something. Uh, so we might have to go back and change our model uh, and add things that we thought weren't needed. Um, and, um, so this is, okay. So I said there, that's a caution when we're making a model of a system, we will try to include all the things that we think are relevant, exclude the things that we don't think are relevant. Right. But we should be looking forward enough in our mind to anticipate what, what actually are the things that are relevant. So we don't get caught up with the van problem. Right guy wants a van well that's relevant but we didn't think it was relevant we only thought that th we don't care as long as it's a vehicle turns out it does matter so i guess the idea there is when you're doing your modeling is to um, be as close as you can to the the actual requirements and and that means maybe talking to the business people a bit you know and sort of find out you know how does the business work a lot that's really quite a good thing to do before you sort of get going all right, so we talked about abstraction. Let's talk about uh, modeling. And as I mentioned, it is a subset of abstraction uh, where you get a simplified view of a system so that you can approach it and come up with a solution. And here's an example that, um, now I'm, I don't know if the people at home can see this. I'm hoping I, I should take my, uh, don't go away folks until I take my, um, my attendance of you. So this is a model of a turnstile. This is a dynamic model. So what we mean by that is that the state actually changes. So what we mean by that is when the, and I'm sorry, I can't read it without my glasses, but when the, um, uh, when the person uh, uh, approaches the turnstile, they're going to push on it. It may be locked. And so they cannot enter. So it has a state. The locked thing is a state of the turnstile. So I don't know if you've seen these. These would be the turnstiles well, nowadays we don't use coin. Coin is kind of funny. You, you, in um, the UK, if you get on the metro there, they have this card, which is called the Oyster card. And the Oyster card, uh, um, you pay money. I, I, how does it work here at the, you guys use the cutter? Do you need a card? Do you, do you, you need a metro card? Yeah, so, I mean, in the UK, you have to have this card and, and there's a turnstile, it won't let you through unless you touch it on the card. And when you touch the card on it, it's kind of like your credit card, but it's a special card and um, uh, it will deduct the amount of money um, that's necessary for you to get through the thing. So imagine that as your Oyster card or whatever, instead of inserting the coin. And then what will happen is the turnstile will open. Okay. And uh, uh, what, so when you turn the coin, the actual state of the turnstile, we have more than one state. You can open it. Or it, can, or it can be locked. So then when you push the turnstile and move your way through, once the one person has gone through the turnstile, then it locks again. You put a coin in, opens, move through, locks. So the turnstile is a dynamic system, right? Whether or not it's open or, or locked depends on inputs from um, the users, right? If you push on it after you've included the coin, it will let you through and then it'll lock after you get through. Then if you put a coin in or waste your card, uh, it will open again so that you can get through again. That's what we mean by dynamic. Dynamic is just a fun word, which means that things can change. And so things can change. We can have states that can change. So we've got a state here of either locked or open. Uh, transitions, uh, moving from one state to another, we got a transition there, which is where we record the transitions. We're Got two transitions there. We can push on the turnstile. That's a transition. Or we can insert a coin. And we, if we were going to do a computer system for this, we would. That would be some kind of a a line of code, right? Where we'd say push, and or we'd say insert. You know, there, there's something there. You know, imagine a robot doing it. 
Uh, events can happen. So event here is somebody pushed it and actions also are kind of related to those transitions. Um, I'm gonna finish up with this couple of slides. Uh, the diagram on the left is the town as it was, I suppose, four or 500 years ago. It looks pretty small, doesn't it? Uh, it was the town of uh, Konigsberg. Konigsberg is, the German translation of that is Kingstown. Uh, so Konigsberg was in what we call East Prussia, which is now part of what we, of the Baltic states. Um, I guess it's Lithuania. And um, uh, it, the city there is now called Kalin Kaliningrad. And that's because uh, the Russians took over that part of it. So there are a lot of German speaking people there, but then the Russians took it. And so it got a Russian name, et cetera, Kaliningrad instead of Konigsberg. All right, so anyways, there was this guy and his name was Le Leonard Eulen, Leonard Eulen. And uh, he was asked to solve a problem for this city. And the problem was there's seven bridges in this city and four different parts of the city. So the four different parts of the city are represented by the um, oval sort of objects there. And the bridges are represented by the lines that connect them. Okay, so, but in the, but the actual town of Konigsberg is represented in the picture to the left. So Leonard Eulen, he looked at that and uh, he said, okay, so the problem was, can you, can you cross all seven bridges in Konigsberg? And so, I mean, in the, in the map, you can see there's a bridge there and et cetera. So can you cross all the bridges in Konigsberg without going over any one of those bridges more than once? So is it possible to cross all the bridges, but not cross any bridge more than once? And so what he did is he looked at the map of Konigsberg and came up with a model, right? He said, okay, there's four different parts of Konigsberg and there's seven different bridges and this bridge connects that to that and this bridge connects that to that. And this one here, this one here. And um, so, so I hope you can see what this means is that the West Island is con connected to the North Bank by two different bridges. Uh, whereas the West Island is connected to the East Island by one bridge. Uh, East Island is connected to the North Bank by one bridge, et cetera. The South Bank is connected to the West Island by two different bridges. And so um, by making this model, uh, Oilin was better able to come up and no computer involved, right? So this is a model they were, they were talking about four or 500 years ago, right? But he was able to actually determine the fact that no, you could not go over, go to all of the different parts of the um, city um, and touching each one of those um, bridges once, but not touching any of the bridges twice. And there's a little activity for you, I suppose, is to try and do that, right? So, you know, can we go across there without, you know, see, the problem is we end up going over a bridge twice. Um, is it possible to do that? And this makes it, this little model, I hope that you'll be able to look at that and see that that's kind of obvious that actually this model makes it a lot easier to solve that problem, right? To, uh, that rather than <laughs> looking at the map here and trying to figure it out. So, um, so going back to where, how we started this lecture, there's a lot of facts that are represented in this model of Konigsberg. Uh, not all of those facts are relevant to the problem that we have. The problem is how do we get to every one of those islands or parts of the city using all seven bridges, but not using any of the bridges more than once. It's kind of hard to solve with all of these irrelevant facts in the way. You know, uh, what do I mean by irrelevant facts? Well, the fact that this plot of land here, we seem to have a road there uh, between this and that. Um, there's a, a, a river through there, or what else we got there? Well, it looks like some kind of big public park or something over there. You know, all very interesting facts that might be used in another problem, but they're not really useful to this problem. To this problem, all we need to know and we have abstracted it, and we've built a nice little model. All we need to know is that there are four different 
um, parts of the town. And this is how they're connected. And by, by building that nice little model, we're very easy, can test it. And, and so I'll just go through that kind of slowly. Let's say I started out on the North Bank and I want to get to all the bridges. Can I do it without touching one bridge once? Okay, so I've gone across here to the West Bank. I've used this bridge once. Okay, I can come back here to the North Bank. I haven't broken my rule yet. I'm allowed to visit the same place more than once. I'm just not allowed to use the same bridge more than once. So I can come back here, I can do that. And then I can go here, so far so good. This is looking good, right? I've got there, I haven't used a bridge more than once. So I'm gonna go over here, uh, back to the West Island. And so I've used this bridge and here's where my problem starts, right? Because now when I go to the South Bank, if I have to use this other bridge and now I can't get out of the West Island without touching one of the bridges that I've already used. And so that proves the, um, proves the fact that you can't, um, you can't uh, go through there without doing, touching a bridge more than once. Uh, another modeling idea, and you will be introduced to this later in your computing life, if this is your first course here, I, data modeling. We've kind of been doing that a little bit, right? So if you have something uh, which you need to record, record information about, you will model that, and you'll model that in terms of relations relations between things. So for example, if we wanted to store a student in a database at the college, um, we would require to know some things like a student has a date of birth. How many date of births does a student have? One. So that's a one-to-one -one relationship. So that's going to work really nice in a model. And so that's why the number one there is, is there. And that's what we call cardinality. Cardinality is how many of something, how many. Uh, so the student um, has a first name. How many first names does a student have? One. So another one-to-one -one relationship. So that's when we see one-to-one -one relationships, those are things that work very nicely in a single record in a single database. Um, a student has one surname, right? Doesn't have more than one surname. Okay, so they have one forename, for, uh, first name and one surname. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship. They usually only live on one street. We're only gonna let them live on one street. They only live in one house. Uh, they only uh, live in one town and they only live in one postcode. So all of these things are one-to-one -one relationships. That makes a perfect kind of record. Now our cardinality changes when we get to the phone number for some reason. I And I know this here in uh, the college, I've seen people packing around more than one phone, right? So, you know, they got one phone for business. They got one phone for uh, fun or whatever, you know, uh, uh, so um, people have more than one phone, so they can have more than one phone number. Our cardinality has changed. We don't, we no longer just have a one-to-one -one relationship. We got a one-to-many relationship, and that will require us to change the way that we store the data. Um, that's data modeling is a very precise, very well-developed field. If some, if you go on into your um, your careers in, uh, in computer uh, science, computer technology, whatever, you'll do a lot of data modeling because you'll have to make SQL databases. I mean, we can't do programming nowadays on the internet without a database, all right? Uh, it's all, that's where we store stuff and it is a relational database. You'll do this. What this means is that we're gonna have to have another separate record uh, to record that, um, that three to one relationship. We say three to one because we set the rules in this particular database that I, that I will we'll store up to three phone numbers for a student. Now, some students will have a one phone number only, and some will have multiple. And so the, I'm not trying to get you to design databases right now. I'm just trying to get you to see uh, how the abstraction kind of works here in that type of a thing. You will be doing this. Okay, I promise you that. If you'll have to do a database course and you'll have to design tables. This will be represented later as a table, but we can't put the phone number in the same table with the other things because it has more than one possible value. All right, so I'm gonna stop on that. Uh, the last slide, we do have the last slide. I, what I've done is I've given you the um, reference for where I got these diagrams from. I, 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 I did not make these diagrams myself. Uh, computational, th th it's, a, it's a nice book, which is the reading suggestion for this course. Um, how did I get a copy of this book? 
I went to a thing called Scribed, S-C-R-I-B-D, -S I think, Scribed, and um, they have an online version. I had to sign up. They want to charge me $10 a month or something like that. But the first month is free. And I think I could do it down. I know. I don't know. I'm sort of like two weeks into the um, into that. And they do have audio books and stuff like that. So I might stay with it. All right. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to take a note of who's here doing a snip. And I'm going to ask students if they have any questions. I have to go soon, actually. I can't stay late because I've got another class that starts in like 20 minutes. All right, so I'm going to save that. That's who came. Uh, so what's today? Today is the uh, 14th of September, 2021. This is INFS. One uh, is section 13. Well, I've saved that. I can put it up later. Any sort of questions? Because I hope you don't mind if I sort of um, make this sort of short and end at that point so I can run off to my other class. Um, I do want to refer you to, there's a little exercise for you to do also. Um, so yeah, have a look at that as well. So any chats? Students, do you mind if I sort of just um, run? <laughs> yeah, it's okay, sir. So I can go to my other class. Um, yeah, it's okay. Students. Thank you, sir. What I want you to do is, is look at the links that I put there. There is a lab to do. I guess you'd call it a lab. It's not. I don't think it's too hard. Have a look at it. I think I put something there. Uh, you, you guys will tell me if I didn't, but I think it's there. All right. Thanks, students. Bye-bye.